biology. Uh, my concentration is in botany. My wife defines a botanist as someone who can ruin a perfectly relaxing walk in the woods. Okay. And if you've ever heard me speak before, you've heard me say that. And um, just recently I was talking to my wife. I said, I don't know why it takes me so long to prepare for one of these presentations. And she said, I don't know why either. You always tell the same jokes, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna be talking about spring wildflowers. I wanted to start with um, this handout that I've given everyone here. And I think it's available somewhere on, online. And what this basically is, is information on spring wildflowers is primarily uh, field guides. Um, and where you can get information on identifying spring wildflowers. It, um, and I wanna show a couple of those and, and, and talk about a few of those. First of all, I'm gonna start with uh, Earl Kors, uh, Spring Wildflowers of, of uh, West Virginia. And although it's West Virginia, it's pretty applicable to New York. And um, it, um, it was originally published in 1958 and it was released a couple different times um, since then. It's still available on Amazon. And uh, Dr. Kaur was, uh, he's the grandfather of botany in West Virginia. He was, uh, I went to graduate school at West Virginia University and Dr. Kaur was there as an emeritus professor when I was there. He's one of these grand old botanists. You know, one of these guys always wore a suit and tie, you know, in the field, in, in, in the office, in the classroom. I mean, I was there in the early 70s. All us graduate students were all dressed like hippies, you know? And there's Dr. Kerr, Dr. Kerr with a dark suit, white shirt, narrow tie, you know? Grand old man of botany. But the, these are both good. There's a couple other ones. This one for spring wildflowers of New England uh, by uh, Marilyn Wally. It's not as complete as Dr. Kerr's, but it has some color photos in it. And one I re another spring one that I just bought recently, Spring Wildflowers of the Northeast by Carol Gracie. And this one is not a complete flora. It has selected split species in it. It has life history information on selected species. Beautiful photographs and very detailed information, two or three pages on each species. I just I haven't really read it all, but I just purchased it recently. Um, there's a few other just general wildflower guides. Uh, and these are color ones, uh, one by uh, Steve Clements and uh, one by uh, Ted Tilleman of uh, for New England. And these are just color photos and, the, and they're separated by the flower color. And they're arranged that way, both of these. And, and, and they're both pretty good. The one that I like the most though is uh, Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. And uh, it originally came out in a hard um, and a paperback version of it. It was published in 1977. So it's, it's kind of dated. Um, if you get the, I like the paper one, you can throw it in your pack and after a while it looks like that. If you had it in your pack for a few years, your field pack. But, Although it's, the nomenclature is quite outdated because it was 1977. But if you look on that handout, you'll see that Steve Young put together an update of all the plant names, changes from 77 to today. And if you look on the reference there to Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, you can get this through the Floor Association website. If you look there on that reference, you'll see how you can go and get that. And it's a nice, neat little printout of all the plant nomen nomenclature changes since 1977. Steve Young put this together. On the bottom of that page, uh, there's a website for the New York Flora Association. Uh, I happen to be treasurer. Uh, it's a great organization to belong to it. It's only $20 a year. It's a statewide organization. We have a lot of field trips, workshops, newsletters. It's a, it's a great organization. The other thing Carol mentioned, the Flora Atlas. How many here are familiar with the Flora Atlas? A few of you are. The Flora Atlas has information on every plant in the state of New York, every single plant, over 3,500. It's not really a key 
or a, a guide, but it has distribution information and a lot of other information on every plant that grows without cultivation in the state of New York. David Warrior is the main driver behind that out of Ithaca. It's a great source of information uh, on the plants of the state of New York. It's a free, free online, go to that website. Uh, you can work your way through it. It's a, it's a great place to get information. So uh, one of the things I mentioned about Newcombs and uh, one of the reason I really like Newcombs, well, let me ask this question. How do you tell that this plant is related to that plant? What parts of the plant are used to say, okay, this plant is related to that plant? Who can answer that question? What parts of the plant? Does anybody know? Pardon me? Uh, some people say leaves and, and, and other things. It's not vegetative structures, it's reproductive structures, okay? The reproductive structures. Today, we're gonna to be talking about flowering plants and the reproductive structures in flowering plants are in the flowers, obviously. And then what I like about Newcombs is that he divides the plants by the number of flowering parts, three part of flowers, four part of flowers, five part of flowers. And that's the way they're divided uh, in botany. Okay, the way they're organized by their flowering parts. Uh, some of them have regular flowers, irregular flowers, many parted flowers. That's why Newcombs is such a, a, a nice, nice cube. Okay, before we get to the slides, the PowerPoint presentation, there's two questions I like to ask people when I'm talking about spring wildflowers. The first question is this. Why do spring wildflowers develop so quickly? I mean, the spring wildflowers, they come up, they flower, they fruit, and they, some of them die back within two, three, four weeks of time. Why do they do that? Why do they develop so quickly? Who can answer that question? Yeah. Light, I got exactly right. The answer is, is light. Most of them occur in deciduous forests, beneath deciduous forests, and as the trees mature in the springtime, they leaf out and they shut off the light supply to the plants that are growing on the ground. So they, the spring wildflowers have to act quickly. Um, in central New York, our canopy closure is around May 15th, depending on the year. Um, so that's, they really try to do everything prior to that date or around then. So they have to do it quickly. That's, that's the why. The second question is how. How do they develop so quickly? I mean, the frost just left the soil. It's very cold out there. How do they spring up? Some of them flower before they leaf out. How do they possibly do that? Where do they get the energy? Who can answer that question? How? The root, there's, the answer to that question is they have some kind of underground structure that stores energy. It could be a storage root, it could be a tuber, it could be a rhizome, a corm, a bulb, and all those are different kinds of underground storage structures. All, most all of them are perennial. They come back every year and they have some kind of structure under there that gives them the power, the energy to shoot up first thing in the spring before the roots to actually develop. So those two questions are important. Why and how of spring wildflowers. With that, we are going to go to the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I wanted to mention this, this cover uh, title photo here. Uh, that's actually from Long Branch Park. If people here are familiar with Long Branch Park, it's at the northern end of Onondaga Lake. It's a great place to see spring wildflowers. Inside the loop trail there, that forested area has a nice diversity of spring wildflowers. You need to get somewhere where there isn't a high deer population. The deer population has affected spring wildflowers. Places like Beaver Lake, it's a great place, but too many deer. So um, there's a lot of good places. Long Branch Park is a good place. And this, this, this photo is from Long Branch Park. It's a good place to see them in the springtime. So,
I am hitting the arrow. <laughs> Oh, I think. Yeah, it, it was, it was, it was, oh. thank you, Carol. Um, I'm going to start with the spur, the first spring wildflower, and uh, these first couple photos were taken on April 1st. The reason I know it's April 1st because it's the first day of trout season, and uh, that's a religious holiday for me. Um, and on that day, when I took these photos, I was walking to the stream, there was snow that year, and I see these perfectly melted circles. And in each, in, within each of those circles is the flower of skunk cabbage. So skunk cabbage is our first spring wildflower. It's flowering, probably some of them are flowering right now, even in the snow. It actually gives off heat. It can melt snow. You can see these perfect circles that it's formed. This is in the Araceae family and the flower has a, a covering over it. It's called a spathe. That uh, reddish covering there is a spathe. And the flower is within that, on that stalk that you see there, that's called a spadix right there. And those little yellow things there are on that stalk. Those are actually the flowers, okay? Skunk cabbage. And if you take the flower, the space apart like that and look at the flower and smell your hands, you know why it's called skunk cabbage. <laughs> it has a really bad smell, okay? But you wonder, why does it have such a bad smell? Well, if you're gonna flower when there's snow on the ground, maybe you need something to attract insects to help pollinate your flowers. So maybe that's why they smell so bad. But it's, it's mostly in wetland areas. It's our first spring wildflower. Another wetland species is marsh marigold, very showy, uh, quite tall, a couple feet tall, has these yellow flowers, it's actually a buttercup. It's in the buttercup family. You can see it looks like a buttercup. The leaves, the young leaves are edible, sometimes used in salad. It will occur in big patches here. The skunk cabbage leaves are up already here a little later, and you can see the marsh marigold mixed with it absolutely gorgeous. We don't have too many wetland spring wildflowers. This is one of the showy ones. Another one you might see in wetland areas called golden ragwort. And golden ragwort, as you can see from the flowers in the aster family, in the aster family. The genus was Senecio, which now changed to Pacara. Uh, this, but the species part, the species epithet is Aria. Benicio aureus, golden ragwort. The word aureus, anytime you see the word aureus, it means gold or golden. What's the two letter code for gold in the periodic table? AU, okay, comes from the word aureus. The, re, the way you can remember that, if you're in New York City and somebody grabs your gold watch and runs off with it, you could say, hey, you. Um, so aureus, anytime you see the word aureus, it's gold or golden. Senecio means age or old, like senescence, senior, you know, those words. The root word, it comes from old. Dr. Kaur had a, name, a plant named after him when I was in graduate school. And, and one of his former students named this uh, ragwort after him, Senecio Corii. I saw him in a hall one day and I said, you know, it's a great honor. I was congratulating him. He said, yeah, he was thrilled, but didn't know quite how to take it because Senecio Corii means old man cor, you know. <laughs> There's another yellow flowered one, real common one, you're probably familiar with it, fawn lily or trout lily. And um, it's in the lily family, obviously. Very common and very widespread. And the leaves are splotched and they're quite variable. The trout lily, fawn lily names come from like a speckled trout or spotted fawn. So it gets from the leaves being spotted like that. Trout lily or fawn lily. The lily family, the leaves are, the flowers are three parted and they have three sepals, which is the outer row of structures, three petals, six stamens and three ovaries. That's the floral arrangement of all the lilies, three, three, six, three, all right. And um, you can see on the, here, you can see that the sepals are a little bit different. The first row rank 
of, uh, of floral structures and then the petals. So it's 3363 in a floral arrangement. Very common and very abundant. This species, trout lily, the leaves will die back. Everything will die back after spring. It's a true spring ephemeral. That's why we call them ephemerals because they come and go. Another three-parted flower one that probably most of you are familiar with are the trilliums. There are several trilliums. Everything about the trilliums are in threes. Um, it's an absolutely uh, gorgeous flower. This is red trillium or wake robin. Um, and you can see this also, this was originally in the lily family, got moved out of the lily family, but there you can see the three sepals, three petals, six stamens and three parted ovary. It also, they all have a three, three, six, three floral arrangement. Keep your eye on those floral arrangements. They'll help you identify your plants. This is a beautiful flower, okay? If you get your nose down next to it, you'll know why it's called something else. It's called Stinky Benjamin. It has a bad smell. It doesn't smell pretty at all. I don't know why they pick on Benjamin. I don't know why, why isn't it Stinking Joseph or Stinking Dolores or something, but they call it Stinking Benjamin. I don't know where that Benjamin comes from. A couple other trilliums are large flowered or white trillium. Trillium, the trilliums are in a genus trillium. This is trillium grandiflorum. So it's large flowered trillium. Very abundant, very common. These are all the trilliums are protected. The large flowered trillium, sometimes uh, as the petals age, they start to break down, they turn pink. You see some of them here are turning pink. What they found out was that actually it's a pH change, kind of like litmus paper. I mean, they turn more acetic as they, as they age and, and they turn pinkish. I think this is from Long Branch Park. Another absolutely gorgeous one is painted trillium, just spectacular. You're gonna see this on a little more Northern, more shaded, more acetic soils, like under hemlock and those kind of situations. Absolutely spectacular. And you notice, Notice, uh, you can see this rose streaks in the petals, but notice how the petals undulate. And this, this one is trillium undulatum because of that, because of the petals wavy like that, undulating. Probably most of you are, feel, are familiar with jack in the pulpit. We have two species, an upland one and a wetland one here in central New York. This is also in the air racing family with skunk cabbage. And, um, you see that covering over the top there? That's actually the spade. If you pull that back, then inside would be the spadic and the flowers would be on the base of the spadix down there. Um, where I grew up, we, we always called this uh, Indian term, Indian turnip. That was the, the name we always used for, for Jack and the Pulpit. It has a, a very big uh, corm, it's actually a corm that's edible. It's uh, supposed to be very nutritious. It was collected a lot by Native Americans and used, but you have to boil it. You have to boil it. It has oxalate crystals in it. And if you take a raw one and cut it and touch it to your tongue, it will feel like somebody stuck a bunch of needles in your tongue. That's something that your big brother does to you when, you, <laughs> when you're young. I have five brothers and it was, that trick was played on me. But it's a very edible uh, and um, one that was collected a lot by Native Americans, but you got to boil it. Jack in the pulpit. Another early one is spring beauty. There's two species here, a narrow leaved and a broad leaved one. Very, very pretty. This is going to be in a rich deciduous forest. When I say rich deciduous forest, I mean nutrient rich. And, you know, it'll be maples and maybe some beech, but it's in a, a rich area, a little bit towards the higher pH side. And uh, that's where you're going to find a lot of these spring wildflowers. And see how the, the petals are streaked here. Actually, the, the, the stamens, the anther, which is the tip of the stamen, that's where the pollen comes from. That's the same purplish, pinkish color as, as the streaks. This is the broad-leaved one here. It's a little bit bigger, and look at those. Look at that beautiful flower and uh, and those and those uh, uh, those anthers. The color of them, very very pretty. Spring beauty. 
Another one under which deciduous forest is liverwort. It has a white flower. This one does. There's two species. The flowers don't last long at all. A week maybe. Tops. They flower before the before the leaves even sh show up. You know. Then when it when the leaves finally mature, the flowers all gone. You notice the three lobed leaves here on liverwort. Uh, and anytime you see the word wort, wort's an old English name for for plant, so it's like liver plant. You see the three lobe leaves. Well, the early herbalists, and most of our early botanists were herbalists. Um, that's where, and, and physicians eventually. Um, but there was a belief that God put a sign on all plants for the use by man. And this belief was called the doctrine of signatures, that God signed every plant for man's use. And this plant with its three lobe leaves was thought to be good for our ailments of our three lobe liver. So it was called liver work. And the genus is hepatica. And what's the artery that feeds our liver? Hepatic, okay. So that word, when you see that word hepatic, it's something to do with liver, liver work. Blue cohosh is another one you might be familiar with. Uh, it has this purplish, smoky looking foliage, you know. There's two species here, originally thought to be one species, but was divided into two. Uh, the, the one of them, it flowers before the leaves expand and the, and the petals are very purplish, uh, very purplish color. Um, and it, it will flower before the leaves fully expand expand. This is in the genus Colophyllum. And this, this plant is poisonous. Nothing eats this plant. Deer don't eat. Nothing eats this plant. I mean, it has a, a bluish fruit. I see them in the middle of winter. Nothing eats that stuff. Uh, this is the other one that flowers a little later. And uh, usually the petals are pale, pale purplish or sometimes can, can be yellowish. This is colophyllum phylectroides. Blue cohosh. This is a, another white flowered one. And uh, this is blood root. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with blood root. It's easy to transplant. The same with uh, Jack in the pulpit is easy to transplant. One thing I'm going to talk about and mention here is that you shouldn't be taking somebody's plants from their property without their permission, all right? They're nice to transplant, but make sure you have the landowner's permission if you're ever gonna transplant a plant. The, the plants belong to the landowner. If you're taking plants from somebody else's property, you're stealing them, you're stealing from them, okay? They belong to them. This one is actually on a protected plant list in New York State, uh, blood root, because of over collecting. But I have some around my house that I collected from my property. It grows very well and expands very well. It has a kind of an interesting looking leaf. The petals don't last very long at all. It has a scallop looking leaf. And the root actually, it's a rhizome, is blood red. I mean blood red. It's called blood root, but the roots are down here. This is actually the rhizome, okay? And um, a lot of times when I'm out in the field, and I come across blood root, I'll cut one and I'll get some of the, um, the, the sap on my finger and I'll ask someone if they want their face painted, I'll paint it their face, then I'll tell them it doesn't come off. But this one, uh, this is in the poppy family and most of the poppy family has some kind of a colored sap. This was used by Native Americans and others for paint, you know. Okay. It does come off, but it's hard to come off. <laughs> Blood red, blood root. It's in the genus Sanguinaria, sanguine, like my complexion, sanguine. This is an absolutely gorgeous one, uh, fringe polyga, polygala, or sometimes it's called gay wings. This is about three or four inches tall, this whole plant. You're gonna find this in sandy soils, a little more acidic. Looks like a little butterfly, you know. John Burroughs, uh, the naturalist, uh, wrote one time that uh, coming across the patch of these that it looked like a, 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 a group of butterflies had alighted on the ground around him, you know, and that's what they looked like, the irregular flower, uh, but absolutely uh, striking colors, very pretty. 
Another one you're gonna see is ginger, wild ginger. And uh, the flowers are always buried beneath the leaves. Uh, here I scraped off, off the leaves so you can see the flowers. It has two big chordate leaves. Chordate means heart shaped. And the flowers buried under the leaves, buried down there under the leaves. It's kind of a pretty flower. Uh, the plant itself is very hairy. And uh, you wonder, well, if flowers are buried under the leaves, you know, that can't be very good for getting pollinated, but they found out that ants are involved in, in, in uh, pollination and also in seed dispersal with ginger. The, the rhizome of it has a ginger smell to it, but it's not the same as the spiced ginger. This one you're gonna see in rich deciduous forest. Uh, this is called squirrel corn, and you can see the foliage of it, very dissected underneath is kind of whitened down there in the left-hand corner of that, of that picture. Uh, botanists call that glaucus when it's whitened like that. It has a white flower. This is also in a poppy family, but notice these, these tubers. These are actually tubers, look like kernels of corn. That's where it gets the name squirrel corn, okay? Those are actually tubers. And tubers are uh, enlargements uh, of a rhizome. A uh, white potato is a tuber. And the eyes on a white potato are the buds, okay? So uh, these are actually tubers. I'm sorry, yes, these are tubers uh, on, on the squirrel corn. The flower is quite pretty. It looks like that up close up. There's another closely related one. Um, that's called Dutchman's Britches, okay? It's supposed to look like pantaloons, you know, or an upside down tooth, you know? Uh, but the foliage is identical to squirrel corn. I don't think you can tell them apart. I can't tell them apart. And sometimes you'll see them growing together. Here you have, on the right here, you have Dutchman's Britches. And on the left, you have squirrel corn. Dutchman's Britches doesn't have those little corn kernels, tubers on the roots, the only way, when I see one without the flowers, I'll look down and say, oh, this is squirrel corn, I see that. But I think that's the only way you can tell them apart when they're not flowering. The flowers look very distinctly different, obviously. This is one of the bellworts and the flowers are upside down. Uh, this is the large flowered bellwort. They're yellow flowers. This was in the Lloyd family, got moved into another family. Uh, there's a few species of bellworts. Uh, this one, uh, the base of the leaves, it surrounds the stem, and botanists call that perfoliate. It perfoliates, it goes around the stem. There's a couple other ones that aren't like that, but this one is. This is the large flowered bellwort. This one here is called Solomon's seal, and the foliage looks a little bit like bellwort, but it's not branched. This it has an unbranched stalk to it. And the flowers are totally different. That's the flowers. That's a mature flower. That's as showy as they get, you know, and they dangle down underneath the, the stalk there. Solomon's seal. It gets the name from at least when this stalk dies, it leaves a scar on the rhizome that looks like a wax seal. And it's supposed to look like the seal of King Solomon, whatever that seal looked like, I don't know. But, uh, so that's where it gets the name Solomon's seal, Solomon's seal. Another one that looks like Solomon's seal, the foliage looks kind of the same, it's called false Solomon's seal, all right? But look where the flower is. The flowers are cluster these white flowers at the tip, totally different. And it, once you see it, it has a shiny look to it. Uh, it's, it's, it's much shinier green leaves to it. False Solomon seal. This is Canada Mayflower, sometimes it's called Canada Lily of the Valley. Uh, it's not a lily, but um, May, Canada Mayflower is probably a better name for it. A small plant that uh, this is what the flower looks like. You're gonna see in shaded acidic soil areas around hemlock and those type of situations. Quite common and, and very widespread uh, in those situations. This is one of the toothworts. And uh, there are several toothworts. Uh, this is called two-leaf toothwort. It 
when you look at this, you say, wait a minute, that looks like it has three leaves. But actually there's two compound leaves. This is one leaf and there's one another leaf over there. So this is a leaf with three leaflets, okay? Um, this is two leaf tooth work, all right? Tooth work, tooth plant. Uh, this is what the flower looks like when it opens up. This is in the mustard family. The mustard family has a four-parted flower. All the mustard family has a four-parted flower. And it was the original family name was crucifery, or part of like a crucifix. And you've heard to eat your crucifers, okay, broccoli, cauliflower, those are all in the mustard family. That comes from the crucifery. It's now the brassicaceae. But the original name was crucifery. Almost all the mustard family is edible. Not that it might be good to eat, but it's edible, all right? It's not gonna kill you. The toothworts, the rhizome is very, has a very nutty taste to it. It's, it's, it, it really does have a good taste to it, uh, the toothworts. And um, it was in the genus Dentaria originally. The word dent, dent means tooth. If you think of dentist, denture, dentition, it all relates to that root word dent for tooth, okay? Toothwork. And it, this one gets the name from when the, when the flower, before it opens up, it kind of looks like a tooth, you know? Um, there's a couple other species. This one is slash toothwork. Again, you see that four-parted flower and very cut leaves or cut leaf toothwork, lacinieda, lacinieda, mean cut. Most of you are familiar with mayapple. And actually I did my research work on mayapple. And um, mayapple was in the genus Podophyllum, and it has a peltate leaf, like a little umbrella, like a little umbrella. It's called peltate. Extensive rhizome system, and they spread out like this. Uh, pretty tall, a foot and a half, two feet tall. You've seen big, you can see big patches of them. And uh, the more mature ones, the older ones, the leaves will be forked. They'll have two leaves. And the flower, flowers are a couple inches across, very uh, shiny looking. And uh, it produces a pretty good sized fruit, which I've heard that it's edible and I've heard that it's not edible. My apple, the plant is, is, is poisonous. The European one, mandrake, was always a well-known poisonous plant. One of those things that Shakespeare is always pouring in somebody's ear, you know, but um, this one uh, is poisonous and I've eaten the fruit, but I read somewhere that it's supposed to be poisonous, but it didn't kill me, but I don't know. Uh, a, pretty, a pretty plant. This one is called wild leaf and it can be quite abundant in a rich deciduous forest. Uh, another name, if you go into Pennsylvania, where I'm from in the Appalachians or down into West Virginia, it's called ramps. They never say wild leaves, they say ramps, all right? They say it like that, ramps. And um, it's being exploited. Um, in a month or two, you go to the farmer's market, you're gonna see it for sale. But again, can be collected and it's very edible. So it has a, it's related to onions and garlic and it has an onion garlic taste to it, very mild. The leaves are edible, the bulb is edible. You can collect it, but just make sure you have the landowner's permission to collect it. It's a, uh, it's in the genus Alium, just like onions and garlic. It has a very broad leaf. And there's the, this is actually a bulb, like an onion would be a bulb. That's that white part that you would eat, but you can chop up the leaves and put them in a salad. It taste is very mild, but if you're going to eat it, make sure your significant other may also eat it because it has, it leaves a smell. It leaves a smell on your breath. That's when you're done. If you go down into West Virginia in April, latter part of April, you're going to see ramp festivals on many, many communities. They have ramp festivals. That's a big thing in West Virginia. The, uh, there's a place in Southern West Virginia called Richwood. And uh, Richwood has had a ramp festival every year since 1937. So they say they're the granddaddy of them all. They're in Nicholas County. 
And if you're in Southern West Virginia, you have to know what county you're from. I don't know why, maybe it's in case the feud breaks out, you know which side you're on, you know? But uh, we were, my wife and I were down there uh, a few years ago and we drove through Richmond. It was a week before the, the ramp festival and they have these big signs. If you come into town, it says ramps. Once you taste them, it's an experience you will never forget. You know, I wasn't exactly sure how to take that, but they are they are very good eating. Is everybody anybody eating them here? A few people. Yeah, they're good eating. One thing about ramps is different than any other spring plant. It doesn't flower in the spring. What it does, it its leaves die back the latter part of May. You can see them starting to turn yellow here in this photo. This photo was taken in early July. The leaves are totally gone, then it flowers. Why it does that, nobody really knows. It's different than any other plant that springs up in the spring. It flowers in the summer. Most of the spring wildflowers flower before the leaves even come out. This one leaves out, the leaves die, then it flowers. Totally different. This one here is called wood sorrel. And wood sorrel, uh, actually this, this photo doesn't do it justice. The flower is just spectacular just spectacular, streaked and very large, much larger than a spring beauty. But look at the leaf. What's that remind you of, that, that shape of the leaf? Shamrock. And there's an oxalis. This is in the genus oxalis. And there's one in, in Ireland. I believe this is where our shamrock came from, OK? Um, but uh, wood sorrel. This one is called uh, star flower, northern star flower. And everything about it is starry. The leaves are starry. The flowers are starry. It has this very starry look to it, you know, star flower. It doesn't always flower. A lot of times we'll see it, like you can see some here that aren't flowering in the back there, but this one here in the, in the middle is flowering. <clears throat> this one here is called gold thread. It has a little uh, white flower. Um, it's a five-parted flower, and this is one you're going to find in shady, acidic soils areas under hemlock, very deep shade. But the rhizome of it, I pulled it up here, is the color of gold. I mean, it's the color of polished gold, bright yellow gold. That's where it gets the name, gold thread. <clears throat> and this plant, that gold thread, was used a lot in herbal medicine for mouth sores, gum diseases. And if you taste that, it's very, very bitter. Several years ago, I had a root canal done. <clears throat> and during the process, the dentist said, he's going to treat it with something. He said, this is very bitter. And he did. And I said, that tastes just like gold thread, you know? And he was wondering what that was. And I explained it to him. And the next time I went back to him, I brought him some gold thread. <laughs> but uh, if you taste that, it's it's an interesting, it's bitter. It's really, really bitter, but uh, it's a big herbal medicine plant. This one's called foam flower. And you're gonna see this along streams, a uh, little more moist situations, has a kind of a dice, a very tooth, deeply toothed chordate leaf. And uh, the flowers are interesting in that the stamens are what they call exerted. It's they stick out. They're longer than the than the petals themselves, um, and um, very very pretty, very pretty uh, foam flower. This is a geranium. It's a native species, large flower geranium. All these species I've talked about. So these are all so far. They're all native species. <clears throat> large flower geranium. This is actually taken that long branch palm. There's a little patch of them up there. It's pretty showy. It's in a genus geranium, just like our other geraniums. We have a few orchids that are come in the spring. You might not have ever seen this one. It's called showy orcus. It wasn't a genus orcus. Got changed to galliaris. It, um, it's a beautiful little plant. It's in a rich deciduous forest, more limestone areas, and a little more uh, higher pH soils. This is actually on my property in Shenango County. A lot of these photos, like the ramps and all that, are from my property. <clears throat> I have a rich deciduous forest, absolutely gorgeous. And uh, <clears throat> it's an orchid. 
orchids obviously they have ear an irregular flower. Irregular meaning that the, the plants aren't the same size. They're not regular. No. I'm sorry, the flowers aren't the same size. The flower parts aren't the same size. This kind of has a leaf that looks like a ramp, but it's, it's uh, thicker and uh, glossier looking. Violets. I'm going to talk about a few violets here. In the springtime, you're going to see a bunch of violets. And there's probably 25 species of violets in New York. And they're not all violet. There you get white ones and yellow ones. And there's a lot of different colors in violets. They're in the genus Viola. <clears throat> For violets, <clears throat> the first thing you want to ask yourself when you look at a violet is, is it a stem violet or a stemless violet? And by that, I mean, this is a stem violet. This is dog violet. It's covered up down here, but it's dog violet. And um, the flower comes from a stem. It doesn't come from the base. We have some violets where the flower comes from the base of the plant with no stem. Those are stemless violets, all right? So this is one of the stem violets. <clears throat> the violets have five petals but it's an irregular flower. The petals aren't the same size, right? They're different size. And um, the lowest petal, the one on the bottom, on the back of it, it will join together and form this little structure called a spur. So that's important when you're looking at violet is, does it have a spur and how big is the spur, all right? Is it stemmed or stemless? And what's the size of the spur? Those are things to look for on violets. And the color obviously is gonna tell you something. This one is called long spurred violet, a native species. And you can see the, why it's called long spurred violet. See that big spur on the back there? Uh, it comes from that lower petal, joins behind it and forms this, this spur, long spurred violet. This one, another stem violet, and is called Canada violet in a rich deciduous forest. It has kind of a creamy looking petals, pretty good size. This will be a foot tall, this plant, and a fairly large flower. You can see that that uh, bottom petal there is streaked like that. But what's interesting about this one is the underside of the petals are purplish or violet. They're uh, you don't see it on the top, but when you turn them over, that's how you can tell it's this one. Uh, and it's a fairly large one. It's one of the stem violets. We have two yellow violets, and they're both stem violets, a smooth one and a hairy one. This is smooth yellow violet. It's another tall one, could be a foot tall in a rich deciduous forest. Pretty flower. You can see those striations in that lower, lower petal there, those streaks. This is the smooth yellow violet, this one. This is from my property. This one, now this is a stemless violet. Now notice there's no stem here. The flower stalk goes right from the base, a stemless violet. And it has a pretty good size spur to it. This one called, sometimes it's called large spur violet. Another name for this one is Helbert leaf violet. Look at the leaf, the base of these leaves, those two lobes overlap one another. That's characteristic of this species. And when you see that overlapping on those two lobes, it's gonna be this one, this Helbert leaf violet. And that big spur, that big, big spur there. There's a few white ones and they're kind of hard to tell apart. Uh, this one is the small white violet or fragrant violet. And it is just about two or three inches tall, this whole plant, but it has the sweetest smell to it. If you get your nose down next to this flower, really, really fragrant, a fragrant white violet, real nice. As notice the leaves are pointed on this one. This is a different one. And this is called kidney leaf violet. Notice that the leaves aren't pointed and the leaves have kind of a kidney shape to them. Um, botanists call that reniform, would be root kidney shape. What's the artery that feeds our kidney? Renal, okay, uh, reniform, like a kidney, shaped like a kidney. Notice that, uh, that the flower stalk here is pubescent too. Uh, 
That's how it's, it's different than the fragrant little white violet we saw in the previous photo here. They are hard to tell apart, those little white ones, though. This is an introduced one. This is not native. This is the first non-native species I've shown you, okay? And um, this one is uh, called English violet. It's a European species. And this one can be white, it can be pale violet, it can be dark violet like this, this photo here. And it's, but it spreads and it's been naturalized. And you'll see it in the woods, you'll, you'll come across it in areas. Um, it doesn't stay in people's yards where it was planted, okay? It's a uh, very, very fragrant. Matter of fact, the scientific name is Viola odorata. And it's a famous European violet. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's wife was a big violet fanatic. And she liked especially this species here. And in Europe at one time, violets were collected, the violets were perfume was made, it smelled like violets, the violets was a big, big thing. And uh, this one is very fragrant too, very, very fragrant. Notice the tea thing, the toothing on the leaves though, very distinct, very, very distinct, different than any tea thing you're gonna see in any other violet leaf. Look at it, look, it's almost crenate. Crenate would be rounded teeth. The other thing about this one is it has a little bend at the tip of the pistol. You see that little hook there, that little hook in the center uh, of, of the flower? That's the, the pistol is the female part and the tip of that has a little hook like a bent finger like that. Only this species has it, Viola odorata. Very distinct, it's a pretty good size violet. You're gonna see it in your yard, I'm sure. Now, there's several introduced species I'm gonna talk about. Non-native species, this is the first one. And this might be the first flower you see in the springtime. This might be. And you'll see it in big patches like this along the side of a road, like here along the side of the road. The flower actually looks kind of like a dandelion. And it's in that family, the composite family. And uh, sometimes I'll see photographs in the newspaper. Or somebody will say, I prefer dandelion. It's a cold sort. Okay. But, um, it looks like a dandelion and it uh, it gets the name from the, the stalk of the flower has these little knobs on them like swellings and it kind of looks like the knobs of the knees of a colt's foot, okay? It flowers way before the leaves come out and then the flowers die back and then the leaves come out. A big chordate leaf eventually. And this is used a lot in herbal medicine in Europe. European species. Good for digestive stomach issues, colt's foot. They say you can, if you burn the leaves, the ashes from it is a good salt substitute. I never tried it, but uh, it's used a lot in herbal medicine, colt's foot in, in Europe and other places. Non-native, very showy. There's a, many buttercups and a few of them are non-native. This is a non-native one. This is called bulbous buttercup here. And the buttercups all have this distinct yellow, shiny uh, petals. But this one, bulbous buttercup, look at the sepals on this one. See how they're reflex back? Those sepals there are bent backwards, reflex. That's characteristic of bulbous buttercup. This next one is our native swamp buttercup. Look, look how different those sepals look on that one compared to the bulbous buttercup, all right? Uh, both moist area species. Uh, this one you're gonna see in open areas, bulbous buttercup in lawns and moist situations. Swamp buttercup's a good, good native species. This is one of the Veronicas uh, in the genus Veronica. And uh, this is a non-native one. There's a few of them here. And the Veronicas, they have a pretty flower. They are uh, streaked. All the Veronicas are streaked like this. These are speedwells also is another name, but it gets the name Veronica from St. Veronica. Veronica wiped the face of Jesus, left the streak, okay, left an impression. So that's where it gets the name because of the way the flowers are streaked like that. Irregular flower, very pretty, very pretty. This is Persian speedwell and uh, 
it's a, it's a weedy, non-native species. I'll tell you a story about this one. One year I was trout fishing. I caught all these trout, a beautiful day, sunny. I was sitting on the bank of the stream, eating lunch. I'm sitting in a patch at this, this Persian speedwell. And it's just gorgeous, you know what I mean? The sun was shining. Like I just got caught up in the moment, you know? And I said, I'm going to take some of this and plant it around my house, all right? You know, you think I would know better. I mean, but I just got, like, like I say, I got caught up in the moment, you know? And uh, for the last 30 years, I've been trying to get rid of that out of my yard, you know? But it's uh, it's pretty, but it's a weedy plant. You know, why I did that, I have no idea. But this one, uh, we just started seeing about eight or 10 years ago here in Central Europe. This is a daisy. And it's called English daisy, a non-native species. If you walk up the trail here along Onondaga Lake, you know, from the Salt Museum up to Willow Bay, you're going to see this one in the lawn. You didn't see that 10 years ago. It's becoming much more abundant. I mean, it's a little daisy. It's pretty. Uh, it's weedy. It's a non-native species. Uh, looks just like a little, a little daisy. This is my last flower, okay? And everybody recognizes dandelion and people curse it and try to get rid of it. I kind of like dandelion myself, you know? It's pretty, it's edible, the leaves are edible. You can make wine out of the blossoms, you know? Dandelion wine, uh, it has a lot of attribute to it. Uh, it's a composite, it has a head of flowers. Uh, the original name of this plant was French. It was dent de leon, okay? Remember that word dent meant tooth, okay? Dent de leon meant tooth of the lion. And it gets that name from these big teeth on the leaves, tooth of the lion. And then it got changed to English dandelion, you know? Tooth of the lion, dandelion. But it's not such a bad plant. But I dig it out of my yard when I see it, but I don't mind it so much. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is this. This photo here. If you get into a good, rich, deciduous forest, this is actually on my property in Shenango County, and you're going to see within 10 feet, you're going to see eight to 10 species. I mean, just a vast, diverse, as long as it's not heavy deer population, you know. But it's not, if you get out looking at spring wildflowers, the one nice thing about it is you can see a lot of plants. And if you get into a really rich, area uh, where there's a uh, few deer, you're going to see uh, a lot of, of spring wildflowers and they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. And uh, that is my last slide. And uh, I hope you all learned something about spring wildflowers. Thank you very much. We're going to take some questions and also I'm going to kind of do this Back here. Does anyone have any questions here? Yeah. Yeah. If you wanted to transplant from the patch, how far down do you have to go? So we have to repeat the question. Okay. Somebody asked about uh, transplanting stock flowers like and uh, how far you had to dig down to transplant it. I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, it's a, you know, it's a perennial. It's a big plant, and I'm assuming it has a, a pretty good sized structure. They're almost always grown in a wetland area. So if you're going to transplant it, you need a moist area, grows in deep shade, and so it you know it doesn't need sun, uh, but wet. I mean, really wet. And uh, but I don't know how far you'd have to dig down. It must have some something down there, you know, something that uh, a, a corm or a rhizome or something. So I think it goes way down. And especially since it's a wet area, yeah, so, you know, it's probably going to go down. Further. You know, but you know, a lot of our wetland species don't aren't very deeply rooted because it's because the oxygen is removed from the soil by the water. And one of the reasons I think we don't have a lot of good uh, spring wildflowers in wetlands, and we we have very few spring wildflowers in wetland area, is because the soil in wetlands takes so long to heat up. You know, to, our, our uplands develop much more quicker, our upland species develop much more quicker in the spring than our wetland species because of that. I mean, water 
is an incredible substance, but it doesn't take on heat very quickly and it doesn't give up heat very quickly. So I think it's because the soils take so long to heat up in wetlands that that's one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of good spring wildflowers in wetlands. But I can't really say I know the answer to your question. Thank you. Bill, can you unmute and, and ask some questions? Sure. The first one is no trilliums grow in the woods around my house, whereas lots grow in the woods, woods just a short way up the road. What conditions make the difference? Boy, I don't know. Um, the question was, the question was uh, a person asked that they didn't have trilliums uh, in one part of their property, but up the road, there was a lot of trilliums and they wanted to know why. Uh, and I'm not sure. I mean, trilliums are uh, a woodland species. Uh, they don't do not do well in disturbed areas. Uh, they, they grow well in, in, in a deciduous forest setting. Um, and I don't know if there's any difference in, in, in deer in that particular area, uh, but they are, they are fed upon uh, by deer. So uh, I, I wouldn't know. It's, it, it should be a rich, a rich deciduous forest is the best for trillion. There was another question here. Maybe part of it is we have a lot of myrtle, and we're in a trillion really struggle when you have the periwinkle, the myrtle growing there. So I don't know if it's got other stuff that's crowding around. Someone here in the audience mentioned that um, they that the, where there's a lot of myrtle, they kind of outcompeted the trillium, and that uh, didn't know if there's a situation where there's competitive plants that might be keeping the trillium out. We have one more question here. How much does that There was a question about uh, seed dispersal, I guess, and uh, that a lot of our spring wildflowers don't appear to have seeds that will get dispersed by by air, although species like dandelion and some of those disperse by air. Uh, but um, I think a lot of them do have a heavier, heavier seed to them. And, you know, animals insects, uh, other animals disperse, disperse seeds quite a bit. So, um, you know, it, that may be the, the way, the method for seed dispersal. A lot of them spread vegetatively because of like mayapple. I mean, you see giant patches of mayapple. They have this rhizomes that just go and go and go and go, you know. So a lot of them do that vegetatively and some seed and I guess just animals would be the main transport. Joe, we have another question. Are, okay. are snowdrops and aconite considered spring wildflowers? Yes, but those are non-native. Snowdrops and aconites, they ask about. Uh, those, those are, yes, and we see them. Uh, and, and they are naturalized, uh, and they are spring wildflowers. Uh, those are a couple of our non-native ones, though. But I see them sometimes especially the snowdrops. Uh, is there are other questions here from the audience. Joe, do you have other questions? Uh, no other questions from Zoom, thanks. Okay. All right, well, uh, I thank you all very much and I hope you learned something about spring wildflowers.